Hello, it's November 12th, 2020. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to appear today with uh, Mr. Jason Ross, who is the science advisor to the Schiller Institute, and also Mr. Hussein Askari, who is the Southwest Asia editor for Executive Intelligence Review and also an activist with the Schiller Institute. Um, Jason and Hussein both collaborated several years ago on the publication of a definitive report on a sort of blueprint plan for the reconstruction of Southwest Asia and Africa uh, by means of the extension of the New Silk Road policy. And uh, Hussein has uh, translated into Arabic the definitive 2014 book length report published by the Executive Intelligence Review titled The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge. Uh, Hussein has been working directly with both leaders and ordinary citizens across the Arab speaking world and Southwest Asia generally, tirelessly trying to educate political leaders there and citizens in the principles of Lyndon LaRouche's economics. He has set up an Arabic speaking uh, school for Lyndon LaRouche's economics online with broad participation. And he um, has focused recently on the application of Alexander Hamilton's policies, Hamiltonian economic policies, including national credit directed towards the reconstruction of these war ravaged regions. Um, these have been destroyed by decades of war. And obviously this is a critical flashpoint uh, in the current situation globally. We've seen an extraordinary breakthrough in this fight just over the last few days as Hussein will tell us more about shortly, where the current Prime Minister of Iraq sent out a tweet saying, quote, there is no alternative to the China-Iraq agreement. And we'll get the full implications and background of that from Hussein in a moment, including his personal involvement in bringing this policy, policy shift around. Uh, I know he has profound interest, uh, and this is very personal for him, being as he is a native Iraqi, uh, and I can say for myself, as an American, uh, this is a topic which I have profound interest in. First of all, because this is the application of the Hamiltonian economic policies which built the United States and made us into a strong, independent republic. Uh, but also because I see this as the only exit from the policy of perpetual war, endless war, which was perpetrated by the Bush administration and the Obama administration. The United States has a profound interest at this moment in the full participation and support in this collaboration to bring the new Silk Road policy into Southwest Asia and Northern Africa. And I think that this is a, um, a topic which is profoundly important for all thinking Americans and global citizens at this moment. So before we bring on Hussein, I would like to invite Jason to just give us a little bit of a broader outline on the current global situation so that we can uh, then come in from above and focus on the significance of this breakthrough in Southwest Asia this week. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, the situation that we face and that Hussein is going to be discussing in terms of uh, breakthroughs and potential. It's one of a, uh, a fight between two paradigms. Over the last decades, the transatlantic economic system has become increasingly based not on physical economy, not on science and technology in the, the broadest sense of really expanding the frontiers of science through space uh, and through nuclear fusion and this sort of thing. Instead, it's focused on an increasing financialization of the economy, on speculation, on maintaining an oligarchical control over economy through increasing the ability of finance to direct it while reducing the potential for physical growth that's required for human well-being and for human development. A new paradigm has been taking the world by storm, uh, especially over the past couple of decades with the meteoric growth of China, which has pulled almost the entirety of its impoverished population out of poverty and is on, the, on its path as it has planned towards achieving a a, a good standard of living for everybody to become a, a, a medium income 
country in the world and then beyond to become a first tier player in science, technology and economic growth. China has exported both its know-how and the economic approach that it took through the world with its silk, uh, with its um, with its new Silk Road project, with its Belt and Road Initiative, excuse me. And this parallels very well the Schiller Institute's new Silk Road proposal for a world land bridge to move for the development of inland areas, of continents, of countries, through the development of a dense and uh, high capacity, high technology uh, infrastructure platform. So what we see today, just in terms of the, the contrast between these, in London has just been taking place a, a summit on green finance, where recovery from funds for recovery from COVID, uh, where the idea of the future is that all projects need to be green. Carbon pricing, green indices, et cetera, needs to be factored into every investment decision. The effect that this would have if allowed to dominate, <clears throat> excuse me, if allowed to dominate um, world development trends and world finance would be to prevent development by insisting on low energy power sources such as windmills and solar at the exclusion of both coal, natural gas, and uh, nuclear power, which is the real energy source for the future as we continue to work towards the breakthrough of having nuclear fusion. So the contrast between this sort of green dead-end outlook and the outlook of physical economic growth that characterized the economic uh, growth of the United States under Hamilton, and as you know, somewhat recently under President Franklin Roosevelt, whose New Deal unlocked the productivity of the American nation in large part through direct investments in uh, large scale infrastructure platforms. So it's exciting for me as a citizen of the world, as a, as a human being, to see this potential being unlocked um, in more and more places around the world and the opportunity to adhere to this new paradigm and break away from the disgusting, uh, deadly green one that characterized the you know, the disastrous Bush administration, uh, the Obama administration, and would characterize a Biden administration were he to come into office. So it's excellent to have the alternative to that, um, as we're going to hear. Well, thanks so much, Jason. So let me just invite Hussein to give us a little bit of background on what's, uh, what's been happening in this region, and then what are the implications of the potential for this kind of deal? Thank you very much, Matt. I'm very happy to be on this show again. It's a very important moment, of course, uh, in uh, in history and uh, also in the history of your nation and Iraq, my native uh, country, but also the rest of the world. I, there's enormous turmoil, as I understand, in your own country, but also we have problems around the world. There, We also have the the pandemic going on. We have a, a, a hunger catastrophe around the world and also potential threat of a war between the major powers, the United States, China, and Russia. But in order to be able to sort out each one of these, I mean, as Jason have uh, excellently explained, that these are not disconnected issues. And as Lyndon Darush have taught us is that to, in order to be able to understand a, a specific strategic or economic problem, you have to like what you do when you look at um, at the uh, Google's the Google uh, Earth program, you look for a certain area, but then you zoom out of that area and look at the whole globe. And then you look back into the history of the humankind, or at least the recent history of humankind. And then you look into the future, uh, where you want to go, where we should be going. And in that sense, all these three, four elements, you have to keep them all in one form in your mind when you discuss the specific issues. So I, to start with, I would like, I mean, I have sent your production team the, um, a few slides. I joined the, um, the Schiller Institute and I've been an associate of Lyndon LaRouche and Helga Sef LaRouche for 25 years. Uh, my fascination with the new Silk Road started already in 1995-96 when the Executive Intelligence Review, which I started working for then, uh, published the first ever comprehensive study of the um, 
the new Silk Road. People popularly called it the Silk Road. Linda LaRouche called it the Eurasian land bridge to connect Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, so since then, I have been obsessed with the idea of building the new Silk Road and also working with governments, with organizations, experts in the region where I, my section of the work in the Schiller Institute, which is West Asia, Africa, to discuss these as a means to have peace uh, through economic development. Uh, we also, as, as Jason said, produced several reports. I translated one of them in which the EIR produced. Uh, it's called the, from the New Silk Road Becomes the World's Land Bridge. And later, Jason and I, in 2017, published the uh, special report extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa. Now, if we look at the next slide, number four, we don't look at West Asia or Africa or any part of the world as separate. And this is the vision in uh, which Lyndon LaRouche and his associates and experts like Hal Cooper, now uh, we, who passed away this year, uh, the, the vision of bringing all nations around a unique, uniting concept of economic development, prosperity, scientific, technological progress, and cultural dialogue. This is the essence of what people call the new Silk Road. When the Chinese president Xi Jinping presented the, um, the, uh, the Belt and Road, he called it the economic belt of the, new, of the Silk Road. He did not say the trade route of the Silk Road because people are fixated on the question of trade along the Silk Road, whether it's the land Silk Road, the belt, or the maritime Silk Road in the sea, uh, which is called the road. It is, yes, trade will become, will benefit greatly from the, from the building of these infrastructure, but what is important is the economic development it will generate. As LaRouche defines it in the next slide, which is called the development corridor, a concept of the corridor. So all the lines you see in our publications extending across the continents, LaRouche said these should be considered as development corridors, which are 100 to 150 kilometer wide with transport, railway, highways, uh, water canals, oil and gas pipelines, and, and then you have uh, uh, power lines, you build industrial, agro-industrial centers and urban centers around them. So the, the human and raw materials of large sections of the planet that are, for example, landlocked, they will come to fruition. They will be utilized for the benefit of all nations. So this is the idea which we have been developing. In the next slide, I have the, one of the best representations of this development corridor is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC. And it is, as you see, it's not one road which brings goods from China to the sea, Arabian Sea. It is a complete uh, development corridor with highways, railways, uh, water dams, power plants, agricultural projects, industrial projects, and so on and so forth. So the Pakistan's economic potential and productivity is raised while China can benefit from that both by uh, employing its companies and also uh, opening a trade route to the rest of the world. It's strategically important. So in that sense, we, we think in the next slide and the region where I've, I have been active to promote LaRouche's ideas, the idea of joining the new Silk Road is what is called the Middle East. I Really, it is called West Asia. There is nothing called the Middle East unless, except in the media and also parts of Africa. But uh, Iraq, my native country, is a strategic crossroad in this whole situation. And now in recent months, uh, this question of the joining the new Silk Road, working with China, uh, has become a major issue. The problem was that people had little knowledge about the Silk Road in general, what it is, and how China works in implementing that project with nations around the world. So in that sense, we have been like 20 years ahead of everyone 
in studying, uh, defining, and advising countries and explaining it for people. So as you see, the maritime Silk Route not only goes to the Suez Canal and to the Mediterranean in the yellow dots, but also it reaches into the Gulf, which is one of the most important trade uh, areas with China and East Asia because of the oil and gas. Most of, almost 80, 90% of all oil and gas produced in the Gulf, which is 40% of the total global uh, oil and gas trade, goes to East Asia, does not go to the United States and Europe, as some people think. Mostly China, Japan, South Korea, India, and so on. Uh, but what is in fascinating in this sense is that it can reach Iraq in the city of Basra, and then from there join the Belt Road, the Belt of the uh, Silk Road, the land-based uh, economic belt, and extend that into the Mediterranean. And in the next slide, we have this image which we use. Matthew and I uh, and others worked on the reconstruction of Syria, but then this concept of the five seas and the Silk Road. Because this region is surrounded by, you know, you have the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, uh, surrounding this area, which can become also corridors for trade between Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, Iraq and Syria and Iran and Turkey are positioned to be a key hub for this. And as you see in the map, we extended this concept from Basra in southern Iraq to, into along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers to Syria uh, and then to the Mediterranean. Now, a big thing is going on, a big fight has been going on in Iraq around a, a land area in southern Iraq. It's called the Al Fao Peninsula, uh, which has become a battleground around the whole global new Silk Road uh, strategy or the new paradigm. The Al Fao Peninsula is the part of Iraq, it's the only outlet for Iraq to the oceans, uh, but it's, it is a, uh, an accumulation of sedimentary silt, you know, brought by the, by the rivers to the Gulf. So it's, um, it's also squeezed between Iran and Kuwait. And historically, Iraq, when the British created the borders between these countries, they squeezed, they they, line, they made the line of the borders of Kuwait, which was a British colony, uh, reach all the way to where you see this red dot called Um Qasr in the west of the map, uh, which is the only Iraqi major port. But you can see what this does to Iraq. It makes it a landlocked country. And this has been a strategic problem for many Iraqi governments historically. So the idea was to build a a major port in the southern tip of the Al Fao Peninsula. This has been an old uh, project, but due to all the wars, the Iran-Iraq war, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, then the invasion of Iraq, until now, that has been almost impossible. So the uh, Al Fao is also emotionally very important for Iraqis because at the last years of the Iran-Iraq war, tens of thousands of Iraqi young men died in a you know trench uh, 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 warf warfare with Iran uh, to keep control of this uh, this peninsula, so it was a completely meaningless war, but that was part of a global strategy which the Iraqi leadership foolishly adhered to. So the idea is, in, as we see in this next slide, which is a, an imaginary satellite picture of how this uh, port will look like. The idea is to build a deep water port with global standards. So to allow major container ships and uh, whole ships to, to dock and, and uh, unload uh, their containers and products and use Iraq as a, as a corridor for trade. But also this is important for Iraq's own development. Uh, so the, what has happened is in, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, we have had like 
it was an economic disaster, but there was pressure on the Iraqi government to start implementing this project. But due to the turning Iraq into a complete rentier economy after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 by the Bush, Cheney, and British, uh, uh, you know, the alliance between the two, Iraq was turned, Iraq was only selling oil and buying 95% of all its needs from abroad. So Iraq was not producing food, not producing any industrial goods, anything else. Everything was bought by oil money. And that's of course, uh, is not sustainable, but there is also, there was a necessity to build this port. Government have a capital budget for investment. So they started with certain small projects like building the, break the breakwater, these two long arms you see in the picture, the eastern one to the right was built by a Greek company. The western one was built by the Korean company, Dai Wu. And these are their allies with the United States in the, in, I mean, in their geopolitical uh, constellation. But this project never was materialized. And last month, the, uh, the manager of the Korean company committed suicide because the Iraqi government never had money to finance the port itself. Uh, but we don't know what his reasons were, but it, the whole project has become a disaster. And this whole area is just, just simply sand at the moment. So in that context, uh, uh, it is very, very important that certain things happen now to revive this project uh, and which I will come to later, uh, and to make this part, as I said earlier, as in the next slide, to turn Iraq into a, a pivot in the whole east, west, north, south uh, Silk Road uh, routes. So, and then that will make it possible for as a, the global image of the new Silk Road we can position Iraq into the larger picture, but also to save the Iraqi economy and give people in Iraq a decent living standard after many, many, many years. Since 91, Iraq has been subject to horrible sanctions after the first world of the first Gulf War. But even after the invasion of Iraq in 2003, Iraq was almost destroyed. All the infrastructure in Iraq was destroyed. Um, and we have two generations who didn't have any real education. Uh, we don't have agriculture, we don't have industry, and even electricity is not restored. Imagine that after 17 years of US British control of Iraq, we don't even have enough electricity in the country. So in that sense, this can, Iraq can become um, uh, an important part of the achieving peace in the world, but bringing the, the major powers to work together for a good cause. Yeah, I think that's exactly as I said in the beginning, I think this is profoundly that the fact that this must succeed is profoundly in the interest of every nation on the planet, including the United States. Um, this area obviously is the crossroads of civilization. This is the bridge between Asia, Europe and Africa. And it's for that reason that it's been such a target for destabilization for so many generations. Um, obviously, the Eurasian land bridge idea of Helga and Lyndon LaRouche was built on a philosophic, philosophical, axiomatic approach to uh, how mankind can work together, which they called the dialogue of civilizations, which was in direct counter, counter distinction to the clash of civilizations. I think that idea is now being expressed in the terms that Xi Jinping has laid it out as a win-win form of, co of cooperation, um, which is obviously in the interest of all nations. And the, the geopolitical outlook, which is now being expressed, you know, by it was John Bolton and Pompeo, that China is an adversary, that this is a new Cold War. This will only lead us down the road to further uh, destruction and further perpetual war. So um, this is a in extraordinarily important way out. I think, as you just said, you know, it's a crime 
when you you visited your native country, you had told me at one point that it had been years since you had been there back to Iraq, but it is still a um, it's whole areas of the country have destroyed infrastructure and no electricity. And, um, you know, when the when the when the neocons said we're going to bomb you back to the Stone Age, that really literally was what had happened to whole areas of the country. Uh, so already back in January, um, Hussein, when I think I had spoken to you last, we had discussed that there was a real potential for a breakthrough on some of this China Iraq collaboration and these credit mechanisms. Um, it was very interesting that, you know, this is has a very Hamiltonian kind of idea. But um, at that point, there was some breakthroughs that were happening. But then all of a sudden, there was a total destabilization of the country, what you had characterized as a color revolution. And this entire perspective just disintegrated and fell apart. And it's very encouraging with this new government, this new prime minister, that it is now coming back to the forefront. I think it's the the pressure of historical events, which is making the making it clear that this is so necessary, but maybe you can tell us how this got derailed over the course of this preceding year. Yeah, just first, we, we, you mentioned the neocons. You see what the Iraq war was a disaster for all parties. I mean, since 2003, the United States spent $1 trillion on the war and the consequences of the war, you know, from taxpayers' money. $40 billion of that money, which was allocated to the Defense Department, is not accounted for. Nobody knows where they disappeared. Even the Congress could not figure out where did that money go. So there are all kinds of dirty operations things. But Iraq itself spent $1 trillion of oil money since then without building a single, you know, real infrastructure project. So that's a really a tragedy. So when the Iraqi government, Iraq and, and, um, uh, and China, they already in 2015, they actually, Iraq signed the Belt and Road Memorandum of Understanding uh, during the Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi government. Uh, and then in 2018, in May 2018, Iraq signed what is called now the Oil for Reconstruction Agreement which is a fantastic agreement based on what I describe and my colleagues, Paul Gallagher especially, describe that this is a Hamiltonian credit method, which I'll come uh, to. Uh, but this was not activated either. People in Iraq say there is pressure from other geopolitical parties, especially the United States and probably Europe, Britain and so on, uh, not to imp implement these agreements with Iraq. But the Iraqi government came under so enormous pressure because of the unemployment, the social unrest, poverty, that they had to go back in 2019, which I have in this slide number 15, the Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi, who was in power just one year then, in September 2019, he went back to China with a huge delegation and signed a number of memoranda of understanding, but also a special financial appendix to the oil for reconstruction uh, agreement, which then activated the agreement. The agreement says that Iraq and China create a reconstruction fund uh, using Iraqi 100,000 barrels, the money from 100,000 barrels of oil, which Iraq already say, sells to China. Iraq sells 1 million barrels a day almost to China, but the Chinese side will take the money from 100,000 barrels and puts it in a special reconstruction fund in a Chinese bank. Then when Iraq has accumulated $1.5 billion <coughs> in that fund, the Chinese credit insurance uh, corporation, Sinosure, will add $8.5 billion dollars, making the fund capital $10 billion. So Iraq does not have to have $10 billion. It's enough. You reach a critical mass of credit, of money into the account. Then China adds 85% of the $10 billion. And immediately, 
the Chinese and Iraqi sides will discuss what kind of infrastructure projects they will be building. That includes ports, railway, roads, schools, hospitals, housing, water management systems, and a whole, it's a full set agreement, as I described with the Pakistani agreement. But in this sense, Iraq will be able to start the reconstruction process without even having money in the budget, so to speak. Uh, so the, and then not necessary to go through the, all the details we have explained that in executive intelligence review, but the Iraqi uh, fund, uh, as I said, it was activated in September, in October, the first money went into the fund. By January 2020, uh, Iraq had already amassed $1.5 billion in that fund, and the Chinese were supposed to add their 8.5 billion to the, and start the work. Now, what happened is as soon as the prime minister came back from Beijing, uh, as I explained in the next slide, we had, due to the frustration in the Iraqi population with the economic and social conditions, especially among the youth, we had massive demonstrations, but then they were fueled by outside groups. Uh, Everybody has theories about who financed and who does, but it went from peaceful into extremely violent. Uh, in, 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 in October, November into December, 2019. And then third force came into the situation, shooting demonstrators and police, which is a typical intelligence operation. Furthermore, amid all this disturbance, in January 3, uh, 2020, the United States decided to take out and assassinate the Iranian uh, General Qasem Soleimani, which we discussed, Matthew, in January, that operation. And also they assassinated with him the head of the Iraqi Shia militia uh, or the popular mobilization uh, forces Abu Ali al Mohandis. Uh, and well, what the only thing we hear from the United States is that Qasem Soleimani was leading for the Quds Force, which was killing American soldiers. But what they leave out is actually since ISIS almost run over Iraq, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian Quds Force, and the Shia militia, and Kurdish militia, and others were working side by side with US forces to free Iraq from ISIS. That part is left out. So anyway, that's not really the story, but the assassination of Qasem Soleimani and al-Mohandis made it impossible for the sitting Iraqi government, which had signed the agreement with China, to stay in power. So it was, that was the final nail in the coffin of the government. So by the end of that month, Adil Abdel Mahdi had to resign. An interim government came into uh, power, uh, which is, still the current prime minister. But then the, the new government did, did not continue the China agreement. They didn't build infrastructure. They didn't change any of the policies and they did not continue the policy of the previous government. And with the, co the COVID coming in and the collapse of the oil prices, which Iraq depends totally on for supplying food and the most simple things for the population, the Iraqi society entered into a new spiral of despair. So that was almost the end of the China-Iraq uh, agreement. Well, what I'd like to hear a little bit about is um, you've been interviewed now just over the last few days on some prominent uh, media channels in Iraq and have been participating in some different uh, dialogues there. And I think that um, it's clear that people there are looking to you, not only for leadership, but have actually seen the policies which you and the Schiller Institute have laid out are now being adopted uh, or potentially adopted by leading government forces. What is the background um, on your involvement and what have you been um, what have you been doing 
in terms of both Iraq, the broader region, the presentation for the reconstruction of Syria and elsewhere, and also uh, beyond just this port deal, uh, what are the broader development projects which can grow out of that for the reconstruction and the development of Iraq as a whole? Yeah. Uh, the reason is I, I mentioned this Alfao port project because this had been become the battle cry for the Iraqi society. And in September, I was contacted by a Facebook group created by young people in southern Iraq, mostly in the city of Basra, where the port was supposed to be built. And uh, that Facebook group has grown now to 270,000, 280,000 members. And they expressed to me their frustration with the government not building the port, but also they told me that there are all kinds of theories how important this port is. The group is called uh, the, the Assembly of Iraqi Honorable Citizens for building the FAO, the Grand FAO project and connecting it to the new Silk Road and rejecting the rail connection to Kuwait and Iran. That's another story, which I'm not gonna go into. But they said, we really need somebody to explain what is the new Silk Road and how the China-Iraq agreement can play a role in both building the port and reviving the Iraqi economy. So I started giving classes almost twice a week on the new Silk Road, the Belt and Road, how it started, but also our background, the history of the Silk Road, which was started by Lyndon and Helga Tseplarouche. I showed our reports and uh, I even put for free to those youth, to thousands of youth and many more in Arab countries, I decided to put the special report uh, uh, which I translated into Arabic on the Silk Road uh, on the LaRouche school for free. So people can download it for free. Uh, and in that sense, my classes about which people said this is the most scientific uh, and objective view of the whole story about the port and the new Silk Road and why it's important for Iraq's reconstruction. But I also managed to give people a clear picture of what the agreement with China means and why this idea of credit of a credit system rather than a monetary system is key uh, in this whole process. So these lessons, which I also have them on my YouTube channel or the LaRouche School YouTube channel, started spreading in the social media around the country to the extent that people in my relatives started contacting me saying that we have seen you somewhere on the social media. Now, there was enormous pressure building up and new groups were created, but then that propelled me into the realm of the official, not official, but the big media in Iraq, which is the satellite channels. So as you see in the next slide, number 20, I was interviewed just last week by two popular Iraqi channels. They just say, look, we want you to explain for us what this new Silk Road is because it's a secret, it's a confidential agreement. And the Iraqi government really failed to explain to the Iraqi people why it is important. That's why it was overthrown. But I happened to have insight into that agreement because of my involvement in, in this whole period. And I could explain in detail why this agreement is so important, especially the credit aspect of it and what kind of projects should be built. So I was, able to explain to the Iraqi people from these popular TV channels, not only the Silk Road, but Lyndon LaRouche's concept of the development corridor. I think for the first time in the Iraqi people ever heard the name Alexander Hamilton. I explained for them why this concept is emer emerged from the work of Alexander Hamilton, the first uh, treasury secretary of the United States and how the United States used this historically, like Franklin Roosevelt used the similar method and so on and so forth. And I compared it to the Chinese agreement. So in that sense, it, 
created shockwaves in the country and people who had a sense that this is a positive thing now have a scientific economic uh, argument to present to the parliament and to the government i was even contacted by members of parliament in iraq who said there is a big discussion inside the parliament about the china iraq agreement they are frustrated with the government not activating it and there is pressure building so last you know two days ago i think the pressure was because uh people started uh i mean people in power started noticing that this is turning into a popular movement uh i have in one slide i put some pictures in slide number 22 where people started organizing small demonstrations uh and gatherings especially the tribal forces in iraq who are very who got much more power because the structure of the iraqi state dissolved so people have reorganized themselves in tribal structures it's not optimal it's not a good idea but that's the only thing the citizens could refer to their tribe their their sect and so on so we had these manifestations of people coming out with iraqi and chinese flags and signs saying we the government have to reactivate the china iraq agreement so in that sense the government sensed that there might be a new revolt brewing under the surface and the pressure in the parliament was growing so they had to take as a now last week something very special happened is that the Iraqi parliament voted for joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. This is very, very, very late because all the countries in the region have joined. 103 nations in the world have joined the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Only Iraq was not. In. So as a sign of this pressure, the Iraqi parliament voted for joining the AIIB. And then two days ago, the Iraqi prime minister, as you mentioned, tweeted that there is no alternative to the Chinese agreement. And then the Iraqi minister of planning came out and said in a TV interview that in the next few days, we will see uh, the activation of the China-Iraq agreement, and we will have discussions with Chinese uh, agencies and companies on, on the projects that should be planned. Now, I know personally from my engagement in Iraq, also from previous time uh, with my consulting company, I think there are very active discussions with both Chinese and international companies to relaunch the FAO port agreement. Now, the Iraqi transport ministry wants all nations to come and discuss this and make a bid, uh, bid on the building the port. So it's American, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, German, you know, all kinds of companies are invited to discuss and present their bids on how they see the most effective way of building the port, but also other auxiliary uh, projects. So the Iraqi government, and also to, this was my advice to the Iraqi government, is that this is not going east or going west. They have to be open to everyone. The United States role in Iraq is very, very important for good and for bad. It's not, you know, it has been bad so far, but they can get the Iraq, the, the American government, American policy to shift into a positive direction by calling on the United States to collaborate with China to make sure that these projects are built because this is the only way Iraq could be stable and that terrorism will not re-emerge again. So I, this is my advice in all my presentations and even my TV interviews because people, you know, they, people throw shit at the United States, which you can understand. The United States role in Iraq has been destructive. But even though that is the general since I tell people, look, we can't solve the problem by creating a, uni, a new unipolar world because that would lead us to world war. We need to become an example for a nation where both East and West can get together and work together. 
Now, is the United States going to do that? Is the British going to do that? That will be proven from the kind of offers they make to the Iraqi government to build infrastructure, build agriculture. So whoever comes with a good offer to Iraq, they should take it, that they should be open to everyone, not only to China. Hmm. You know what, uh, you just brought up at the end there, who's saying that this is something that should be open to everybody. You know, a lot of times these you know, finance type discussions turn into something about what the Chinese approach is versus, you know, the World Bank or the United States. And it really, although that sort of is sort of the, the way things stand right now, it shouldn't be. Um, take, take Africa, for example, the continent of Africa. If you compare the investment in that continent by, let's say, the British or uh, Americans or Europeans generally uh, with the investments made by China, uh, the Chinese investments are much more in infrastructure and manufacturing and less in mining uh, in co contrast to the, the European investments. Now, does that mean that China is the only useful investor in Africa? No. Does it mean that African countries like the fact that many times the best bid is always Chinese and that this is becoming uh, in, in some ways the, the go-to contractor for rail and this kind of thing? Well, they'd like to have choices. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of good that the United States can contribute through engineering and project management and all of these kinds of things. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, capabilities there. So what it is, is it's a it's a unfortunately a terrible and willful decision by the transatlantic countries and power structures to refrain from engaging in totally useful and productive uh, ventures. You know, China sees opportunity in Southwest Asia in Africa. And it takes those opportunities and it's building markets, it's developing its skills at being an international contractor and setting up businesses overseas. Chinese businesses are getting a lot of experience out of this. They're, it's a good thing for them. It's a good thing for countries that they're investing in. Everybody benefits from these kinds of productive uh, investments and projects. And so when you look at the incredible attacks that have been launched against President Trump in the United States, even when he was candidate Trump, where he sort of had a couple of very simple messages that in particular uh, got people angry. He said, a good relationship with Russia is a good thing, not a bad thing. He said, a good relationship with China is a good thing, not a bad thing. And against his presidency has just been a, a, a nonstop onslaught of years of attacks of the bogus Russiagate hoax and of attempts to put him in an anti-China position, which unfortunately with the coronavirus um, has been succeeding uh, to a certain degree. So the danger that we see of you know, military conflicts escalating of the withholding of the financing for infrastructure development, it really all comes together in a sense of what is the direction that the world will take. And as the British financial empire, which still exists, made very clear in this multi-day green finance uh, festivities that they just held in the city of London, uh, that vision of the world is of green debt of financialization of the economy. And there's so much growth to achieve in the world. There are so many projects that are going to be physically productive. There are so many new technologies to implement to improve the productive powers of labor of people in areas all around the world that uh, neglecting to take these opportunities will be both stupid and deadly. And the, uh, the, the vision I have for the world is not one where, you know, People of goodwill around the world end up taking China's side, uh, taking just uh, taking China's side against the U.S. when it comes to these kinds of things. But one where China, the United States, Russia, India, other major players are on more of the same page as cooperating partners, also competitors, but from a standpoint of increasing investment in productivity and of reaping uh, the immense benefits that that will bring. So the... Uh, uh, you the, mentioned uh, the case of Africa. I think there are two questions here, the fight or the, the policies of the major powers that what is the policy and to whose benefit it is? Uh, China is not the biggest investor in Africa. <laughs> it's the United States, Britain and France. 
But if you look, as you said, where they do they invest? The United States, Britain, and, Af and France, they invest solely in extraction, extracting raw materials from Africa and in financial services. So the African economies are not involved in any of the supply chains of the oil, the metals, and so on, which are extracted from Africa. Now, who's benefiting from that? It's not the American or French or British people. It's the city of London and the major conglomerates. I saw recently that 50 uh, British companies listed in the city in the London Stock Exchange, they own $1 trillion in raw material deposits in Africa. <laughs> so these are just a few companies, but they control the raw materials of Africa. China, on the con I mean, China also has investments in oil, metals everywhere in the world. But what they do is they balance the payment with giving Africans infrastructure where African economies can start becoming part of the supply chain. They can improve the living conditions of their population. They can use part of that, these raw materials inside their countries to improve their living conditions, but also to become producers for the world. Like some countries are starting to become like that in Ethiopia, Egypt, they produce things in China built factories for Africa and for Europe. That's the difference in the two um, attitudes of the um, of the the West versus. You know, remember when Obama became president, Susan Rice, who is Biden says might be his next, hopefully not, foreign minister. She played a key role in destroying Libya, Syria, and you know, creating havoc in Africa as a result. Of, but she met with African ambassadors when Obama became president, and she made this famous statement that we do not do infrastructure. And under Obama, the U.S. Export Bank, which is supposed to lend money to American companies working in Africa, it was shut down in principle. So it stopped financing. There was no more investments from the Exim Bank of the United States into Africa under Obama. The Congress also played a role in that because they are not interested in development. Obama himself went to South Africa a few months after Xi Jinping was there say, when Xi Jinping told African leaders, you, Africa is perfectly positioned to become industrial powers as we became. You have all the potential to become industrial power. What did Obama told, tell the South African youth? He said, look, everybody here is talking about development. And if every one of you gets a big house, air conditioning, a car, and so on, the climate or the world will boil over. So forget about development. So that's the difference in the attitude, which is the problem no matter who is in power. So this has to be resolved because this is gonna, nations now are taking power in their own hands. They see the difference between the two models. They might start nationalizing British, French, and American projects in Africa, you know, oil and gas companies, because they are not benefiting their people. Just recently, Djibouti, which is a tiny country in Africa, but very strategically positioned, it has military bases of seven world powers. So they can overthrow the government any day. They decided suddenly to take the major container port from a contract with the Dubai World Port, a huge international conglomerate run by British, but it's registered in Dubai and with Arab money. The Djibouti government told them, look, you cannot have this port for 25 years. You signed an agreement with a corrupt government before. We are taking it away from you. So the Dubai port uh, went to London to an arbitration court and the British Arbitration Court told, told the Djibouti government, you have to give back the port to the Dubai people. So what did, what did Djibouti say to the British court? So you can take that decision and you know, shove it wherever you want. <laughs> this is our port, you are out of here. You know? So this tiny country in Djibouti 
can decide that the British Empire and the Arab allies are not important. Our sovereignty is more important because we we have a responsibility to our people, not to the city of London. And if we don't do that, our people will rise against us. And this is what is going on in Iraq now. The Iraqi government says we have to decide getting assassinated by the Anglo-American forces or being lynched by the Iraqi people. So they have two choices. And the best choice for them is to say we are a sovereign nation. We decide to take over our economy, decide our economic policy, and we are open to work with everyone. Thank you so much, Hussein. Uh, I mean, going all the way back to Lyndon LaRouche's idea behind the OASIS plan, which was the economic development program for peace between Israel and Palestine. Um, it's always been from the perspective that development is the new name for peace. And the 20th century was dominated by endless wars, world wars, endless wars. And, um, you know, Lyndon LaRouche's intervention was always from the standpoint that sustainable peace can only be achieved, attained through shared economic development. I think that's what you're expressing here uh, with this program. Uh, that obviously is also the perspective behind the win-win paradigm of the world land bridge. And uh, the stakes couldn't be higher. So um, as Jason said, we're in the middle, the midst of an all out battle for the soul of the United States and the future of US policy right now. And it would uh, do very well for the American people to see this as being in the interest of uh, our nation, of the entire world. And it really is the road out of the hell that has been created for, for gen from decades of, uh, of endless war and, uh, and the, the, uh, the prevention of economic development and the access to progress and creativity for all, for all people. So it's very good news that um, Alexander Hamilton's policies are now being introduced to more nations and more peoples, and uh, the world will be a better place when we can achieve uh, Hamiltonian economics for the entire globe. So uh, I want to thank you very much for joining me, and I um, am honored to be able to share this broadcast with Jason and with you, Hussein. So I look forward to speaking with you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.